Okay, everyone, welcome to our webcast. I'm uh, Lester Knudsen with Advanced Data Tools, and uh, this is the first in a new series of webcasts on uh, Informix tutorials we're going to be doing this year. The number one uh, Google request uh, I've seen on our website is free Informix tutorials. So we decided to do a series of webcasts uh, that are called free Informix tutorials. A bit of background, I'm Lester Knudsen. I've been working with Informix since 1983, back in the good old days, um, and uh, continue to, uh, to work doing uh, training, consulting, and uh, support. A couple of key notes. This webcast is being recorded, and the replay and the slides will be available in a few days uh, if everything works well. No guarantees, technology does have hiccups sometimes. Uh, please mute your lines uh, to prevent any uh, background noise. And if you have questions, there's a chat button. Uh, please use the chat button. Now, when I'm full screen like this, I don't see your questions. Uh, when I go to not full screen like this, I will see your questions. So if I don't answer a question right away, just bear with me as soon as I exit full screen, uh, I will see it. Uh, so this is a series of eight webcasts on getting started with Informix. And in this first webcast, I'm gonna talk about a little bit on the product overview, a little bit on the architecture, I'm going to show you a demo of installing Informix. And then uh, I actually did a new install yesterday, and then we'll play a little bit with that uh, and, and get up and running on that. And then I'll talk about uh, everything you need to go download and get started yourself with Informix. So a bit of background. Back when I started with Informix, it was a set of C libraries called CISAM. And uh, they were great for a C programmer because that was a way of quickly accessing a record in a file uh, instead of having to write my own uh, libraries. Uh, Informix over the years became a database engine. They added SQL uh, version four in about 85, 86. Uh, was called Informix Online because it was the first database that you could do a backup while it was online and not have to kick all your users off to do a backup. Uh, then came Informix 7 and then came Informix 8, which was a database that exceeded uh, the size of one server. If you needed a, a database uh, to include 100 servers, that was Informix 8. And then came 9, 10, uh, 11, and the current version is 14. And the examples I'm going to show you are all on version 14. There are a couple of editions. Uh, the Informix Developer Edition is free. Uh, you can go download it. I'll show you a link to go download it. Uh, you cannot use it for production. It's for development. Uh, but it has all the features of the full enterprise uh, addition, it's just limited on the size of the database and the number of users you can connect. The Informix Innovator Edition is great for a small company getting started, and uh, it gives you what you need to start with a production uh, instance. Now, you'll very quickly outgrow it, and the two most common ones I see are the Workgroup Edition and the Enterprise Edition. To connect to Informix, you need an SDK product. A, a, the most common one is the Informix Client Software Developers Kit. In version 12 and earlier, this came with the engine. In version 14, this is a separate download, a separate install. And uh, so it's part of your planning in version 14. You need to get the SDK separately. There's also a JDBC driver which is really good if you're uh, writing JDBC. And there is a uh, Informix, uh, I mean, an IBM comma data driver that works with both Informix and DB2. And it has some features uh, that, are, that are unique to it. 
uh, it doesn't have features that are unique to Informix because it has to work with both DB2 and Informix. One of the benefits of Informix is you can add in data blades. And think of data blades or extra data types. Uh, they're objects. It's an object-oriented database. And one of my favorite is a spatial data blade, where when you add that to Informix, and it comes with it for free, uh, you add four different new data types, a point on a map, a line, which could be a road, it could be a stream, uh, it could be something like that, anything that's a line. Uh, it doesn't have to be a straight line, it could be a crooked line. A shape, which is like a piece of property, the outline of a state, uh, anything that's a some kind of shape. And then a image, which could be like a satellite image. And so you can do things with a spatial data blade, like run queries that say, from this point, tell me all the coffee shops within five miles, just like you do in Google Maps. That You can do this with your Informix data. There are a lot of development tools for Informix. Uh, ESQLC, if you're working with C. Uh, 4GL is probably one of the most common ones. It's still out there. Uh, it's green screen. Uh, I love it. Uh, a lot of people still use it. If you want to go to a GUI version of 4GL, you want to look at Informix Generos, a 4J's product. Uh, that will take your 4GL code and run it on Windows, on a Mac, or on the web uh, in a GUI environment. And a couple of years ago, I did a, a webcast on converting to uh, Generos. You can also write in Java, PHP, Ruby, Python, uh, and Perl. Informix also has uh, an add-on called the Informix Warehouse Accelerator. And what this is, is this sits on top of an Informix server uh, adjacent to it, and it's an in-memory columnar database. So you give it your, particularly for data warehouses, you give it your fact table, your dimension table. It will take them, put them in memory. Uh, my benchmark uh, from several years ago, and this still holds, is it took a, a set of queries that took 17 hours to run and ran them in about 10 minutes. Uh, it's, it's very phenomenal. Uh, and it basically puts your whole database in memory uh, in a column fashion. So if you're looking at columnar databases, uh, look at the Informix Warehouse Accelerator. Uh, for administration tools, the one I'm going to show you today is Informix HQ. This is the new uh, admin tool released with 14. It does work with 12. Uh, it's a good reason, if you're on 12, to download 14 and uh, just install the uh, Informix HQ part of that. And uh, there are also command line utilities, and there's a product from AGS called Server Studio, which I highly recommend uh, taking a look at uh, as tools to both administer and use Informix SQL. This is what Informix HQ looks like, and, and I'll show you some, some uh, live examples in a little bit. Uh, Informix HQ works on my iPhone, and uh, it allows me to administer a server walking around on my iPhone if I so desire. Uh, should probably concentrate a bit better when you're administering a server, but it does work. So let's talk about the uh, memory CPU and disk requirements of Informix. There are four parts to the Informix architecture. The first is the SQL clients that connect. These are your users. They're very important because without them, there's no point in having a database. The second part is the server process, which is called on an it. If you're on a Unix box or a Linux box, you do a PS, you'll see a bunch of on and its running. That is the Informix server. The third piece is a shared memory that all the on and its share. And this is key. That's a lot of memory, 
but all of those on it processes share it. That's how they get work done, and we'll talk about that a little bit. The fourth part is the disk space. Uh, these are the DB spaces. This is where your data is stored. And uh, disk space is really important because on a large database, oftentimes it will become the bottleneck uh, because everything has to get written out to disk. So it looks something like this. You have your clients up here at the top. You have your on init processes. Some of the on init processes get requests from clients and do things. They all talk to shared memory. And some on inits will have a special job of writing data out to disk. So each on init has a special job. If you just do a PS minus EF and grip on init, you'll see something like this. A whole bunch of on inits running. One of them will have the uh, parent process ID of one. That is the on init that started uh, when you first started in Formix. And uh, you start in Formix by typing on init. All the others you'll notice are uh, children uh, processes from the second on init that started. I'm going to show you some onstat commands. And these are key to infor understanding Informix because onstat is the command you use to say, what's the status of my online server? onstat minus g sch will show you all the on inits. And uh, I have 16 here on this slide. It gives me their Unix process ID, and the class tells me what they're doing. The AIO on inits are writing out to disk. The CPU on inits are handling CPU processes. Uh, there's an LIO and a physical PIO, which are for the logical log and the physical log. Each on init has a special job to do. Now, each on init is multi-threaded. So you can have 10,000 users all connected to these on inits, uh, they will connect through a SOC on init, uh, which is this one down here, number 11. And uh, the SOC then will fan them out to CPU on inits to do the work. And uh, I've had sites with 10,000 10, users uh, connected. Uh, and you'll have more SOC on inits when you do that. Uh, Next webcast on configuring Informix, we're going to go into great detail on how you configure these on and its. Uh, right now, we're just going to say, this is what happens when you start a default server installation. So here's a list of the uh, on and it classes, which tell you what they do. Memory. The second part of Informix that's important is shared memory. And uh, you have a resident portion of memory. You have a buffer portion of memory. And then you have a virtual memory segment and a message memory segment. And let me start here at the bottom. The message memory segment is just a small buffer that holds uh, data between the client and the server. So every one of your clients will have a little bit of the message memory segment. And it's where data goes back and forth between the two. The virtual memory is the workspace. That's where your client work happens. That's where uh, data sorts happen. That's where working storage happens. That's where caches happen. Uh, that can grow. And as you see it next uh, in the next webcast, uh, monitoring it and sizing it correctly is very important because that will grow uh, if you make it too small. The third section are the buffers. And the buffers are fixed. You start in Formix with a certain number of buffers. Boom, it runs. It takes that memory, it runs. Now, the buffers are data pages from disk. And this is what makes Informix uh, so much faster. The more buffers you have, the more data from disk can be held in the buffers, and uh, the faster everything's going to be. 
I, I worked with a client not too long ago that had a lot of memory. Uh, their database was about 256 gigs, not that big. We made the buffers big enough that the whole database fit in the buffers. Uh, and it worked super fast that way. Informix does still write out the changes to disk. It does log things and it does continue to write out to disk. But by having the whole, whole database in buffers, uh, it meant that users queries could happen very fast. Now, typically what happens is you don't have the whole database in, in, in the buffers, but you have the most used pages in buffers. So if you have a very active table, like a customer table, that will probably be in your buffers. And um, we'll talk about this. Configuring the buffers and the size of the buffers is very important for performance tuning. And then you'll have a small segment of memory, which is the control tables. Uh, and that's where Informix stores all the information that is shared between the different onnets. When you run an onstat command, it's reading these control tables. When you run a query against the SysMaster database, it's reading these control tables. When you run an Informix HQ uh, command or, or view, it's reading those control tables. The command, and everything I talk about, I'm probably going to give you an onstat command to learn. onstat minus g seg will show you the memory segments. And it's not very friendly, uh, but it tells you the basic size in bytes of each memory segment. The class tells you what class of memory that is, R is residence, v, v is virtual, V is buffers. So if I go back to this slide, uh, R is this residence segment right here, V is this buffer pages right here, V is this virtual segment here. Uh, the asterisk there means that that is pinned in memory. It will not get swapped out. Uh, if there's no asterisk, like the V has no asterisk, that means the operating system could swap it out if need be. And it tells me how much is used right now uh, of that memory. And here are the different memory classes. Uh, very helpful to understand that. Now, disk space. Uh, Informix stores things in DB spaces which are really logical containers of chunks. And the chunk is the physical device or container. Think of a chunk as um, a disk or a file. And uh, on Informix has two types of containers. Raw disk is where you give a disk that's not formatted directly to Informix. This used to be the preferred way to do things. Now, I rarely see people do it, even though it is faster. Uh, and I think it, it has some advantages. Because it's raw, and Unix and your admins can't see it, only Informix can see it, um, it's fairly safe. Uh, now, an admin can come along and format it and wipe it all out. Uh, thinking, oh, that's empty space not being used. Uh, but other than that, it is uh, fairly safe and it is uh, the fastest. More and more, though, people are using cooked files. And cooked files are operating system files, uh, big files that are directed to Informix. And each chunk will be a cooked file. Now, the page. Uh, size of each DB space or each chunk will be 2, 4, 8, or 16K. Uh, there's a default page size for every operating system. Uh, typically, it's 2K or 4K. On Linux, it will be 2K. On AIX and Windows and Mac, uh, it will be 4K. Um, and all I.O. is done in pages. So if you ask for one byte, 
it's more efficient for Informix just to bring in a block and it will bring in a whole page and put it into the bu buffer, even though you only need that one byte. But that means the next person that needs a byte uh, from that page, it's already in memory and they don't have to read it from disk anymore. Now, there's something also called a table space, which is all the pages assigned to a table. And then there's something called a constant extent, which is a set of pages that are grouped together contiguously uh, that belong to a table. So typically the onstat command to see your DB spaces is onstat-d. And uh, it will show you here are my DB spaces here at the top. And at the bottom, it will tell me what my chunks are. And it tells me where the chunks are located. And I can go do an LS on this if it's a cooked file. And I'll see a big file that's this size in pages. Uh, a little trick here. You input things in KB. And Formix always gives it back to you in pages. So I said make this root DB space 2 gigs. And Forex said, OK, that page size is going to be uh, 2K, 2048 bytes. And that means it's going to be 1,000 pages. Uh, and so it shows me that the root size is 1,000. Now, I, I've been doing this for so long, I can automatically translate that to uh, 2 gigs. Uh, but but you'll, you'll get used to it. It, it shows you uh, everything in pages. The key is input in KB, and Formix gives you output back in pages. There are ways to convert it, and I'll have uh, sessions on that coming up in the future. So you create a DB space. It can have multiple chunks. Uh, this example here, I have a DB space with three physical files, uh, three chunks. And each chunk is formatted. When you create a chunk or a DB space, the first thing Informix does is go out and format it. Uh, and it sets up these pages uh, on that chunk for you. And then as you create tables, uh, the tables will take pages. And uh, this is an example. As you can see, the orders table here is orange. And it's all over the three chunks. It's very fragmented. And uh, too many extents will slow down disk access. Uh, in a couple of sessions, uh, we will talk about DB spaces and pages in more detail. And, and I will go over how to manage them. Users. Users are the SQL clients that connect up to Informix. And, uh, Without users, there's no point in having a server. So they're probably the most important part of this is, uh, is making sure your users get their data back quickly. The onstat command to see your users is onstat minus u. Now, my little test system, I only had the user in Formix. So everything shows up as a user in Formix uh, here. Uh, but, but these are all my users connected uh, to that session. Now, planning and install. Let's talk about uh, you want to get Informix up and running. What do you need to think about? First thing is what directory will you put the software in? And uh, you can go with the defaults. I prefer to put it in a directory that has the name of the version. And that way I can upgrade by creating another directory with the version name. And then I use links so that when I'm ready to upgrade, I'll install it in a directory on its own version, test it. Uh, when I'm ready to do an upgrade, all I have to do is change the links. And whammo. Uh, so my users always think everything's in opt-in Formix. Uh, but 
to upgrade, all I have to do then is change the link. Uh, it does go through a process of uh, converting uh, your databases uh, when you upgrade that are there, uh, and then you're up and running and away you go. As a quick example, on my server here, I have several versions of Informix. The one that uh, my users connect to is Informix, and this tells me that that's pointing to version uh, 14 FC2. Now I've got uh, 14 uh, FC3, I've got two versions of FC3 installed on the server, but I haven't made them the production server, and that's what this allows you to do. The second thing is to think about what names are you going to have for your Informix server? And I would recommend at least two, and that you may have more. Uh, one for shared memory connections, and one for network connections. And you could have two or three for network connections. You could have different types of connection protocols, and we'll have a whole uh, webcast on network connections. Uh, and, and what they are and how you use them. Uh, you could have a name for, for different network connections. You can also have a name for different network cards. Let's say your machine has five network cards. You could create a connection pool for each network card and have people connect to card one and card two and card three. Uh, you can be very creative with this. Uh, but I would recommend starting with two, one for shared memory connections and one for network connections. The difference is shared memory connections, you have to be on the box because you have to be able to connect to shared memory directly. Network connections, you can be anywhere on the network as long as you can connect to the IP address and the port that Informix is listening for connections on. The next thing you need to think about is how much memory will be allocated to Informix. And you need to divide that into three parts. The buffer pool, uh, the uh, shared memory virtual size, and remember the shared memory virtual size will grow. You really don't want it to grow. The best practice is to make it big enough so it doesn't need to grow. Uh, and then the shared memory add is when it grows, how, how big uh, to allow it to grow. Just an example, let's say you have 16 gigs on a box. You could say, I'm gonna make my buffer pool one gig, and I'm gonna make my virtual segment one gig. So that means Informix is then gonna take two gigs and that will leave 14 gigs free for other things on that box. Could be another server, uh, could be something else. But it's a very good idea when you're planning your install to think about this. The default size for buffer pool is just too small to be very fast. So if this is one where if you go with the default size, you're gonna be suffering uh, from poor performance. Then you need to think about disk space. And I have a whole uh, session on uh, disk space in, in a couple of months. But uh, the root DB space is what you start with. That's the key one uh, that everything depends on. You need space for your logical log and the physical log. One reason Informix is so safe and so crash recoverable and so crash proof is it has two logs. Uh, they're called logical logs. Actually, they're multiple logical logs. It has two types of logs, uh, multiple logical logs and then the physical log. And uh, they both uh, play different roles, uh, but everything you do gets logged to those two places. Then you need temp space. And oftentimes when I do IO uh, tuning, uh, I will see that the temp space gets the most use. You'll be surprised at every application that does a sort, that does an order by or does a group by, probably needs to use temp space. 
And oftentimes on a system, this will be the busiest disk space that you have. You need space for your data. You need space for your indexes. If you have blobs, these are uh, things like PDFs or images or music that you're storing in the database. Uh, you'll need space for that. And smart blobs are a special kind of, of blob space that you, you may need space for. Now, will you use raw or cooked space? Um, like I said earlier, raw uh, is, is the best, but more and more uh, I see people using cooked space because that is just so much easier to manage. So you need to think about where will this space be located? Uh, what I find works best is to, even if you're using cooked space, create four or six or eight uh, logical volumes and four or six or eight file systems and spread out your DB spaces among those four or six or eight file systems. Uh, I, I did a configuration recently that, that was about four uh, terabytes for a customer. And uh, they created a series of logical volumes that were um, half a terabyte and file systems. And we just spread everything out there uh, based on I.O. And that worked really good. That gives them a good load balance across their systems. Now, the key is if you're using cook space, you want to use a non-journaled file system. And the reason is Informix does journaling internally. And the file system journaling can sometimes conflict with the Informix journaling. Um, on Linux, you want to use the ext2 file system. Uh, but Informix does journaling. If your uh, disk SAN administrator says, no, we need a journal file system, you say, why? Informix use, does journaling. Uh, one is you're creating unnecessary uh, duplicated efforts and unnecessary I.O. Uh, and slowing it down. And two is if the Unix file system journaling and the Informix journaling get out of sync, you're in trouble. Uh, and that's what you want to avoid. Uh, so use a non-journal file, file system if at all possible. The next question you need to consider is how many CPUs will be allocated for Informix? Remember, Informix is supposed to be a database server. Uh, it's supposed to be the big busy thing on your on your server, particularly for production. Now, for a development system, one, C, one CPU is fine. Traditionally, we used to say you'd take the number of cores minus one, and that's what you wanted to assign to Informix. So if you had eight cores, you would assign seven to Informix. Um, nowadays, cores are so fast that you can assign two or three on and it's per core. So that traditional uh, number doesn't always hold true. And I've seen uh, uh, folks you know, on a four uh, core system running eight uh, CPU uh, on an ITS. Now I'll talk about this more uh, in the next webcast. And then you want to consider what protocols people will use to connect. And um, with the protocol, uh, what TCPI ports will be used? Uh, every network connection except for shared memory, requires a TPC port to connect. And so you need to make sure something else is using that port. And Forbix cannot share a port with something else. Think of a port as an extension in a telephone system. Something calls up to your box. They say, give me port 8080. And uh, if something else is on that port, two people may try and an answer that extension. Uh, and you'll have conflicts. Uh, so you need dedicated ports for Informix. If you're going to use Informix HQ, 
We need to think about an admin login and password uh, for Informix HQ and what port uh, you're going to install it on. So here's a link uh, to the different Informix editions, and I'll come back to this later. A question, I got this yesterday from somebody before this webcast. Where do I download the Informix Developer Edition? This is the free, no charge edition. Here's the link, uh, and this will be in the slides uh, that you come out. You can come here and say, try the Developer Edition for free. You can download it. You do have to have an IBM login. Uh, and if you don't have one, it'll prompt you through creating one right there. Uh, if you need to use it for production, you can try the Innovator C edition, even though that will be limiting. So let me go through a install. And I did this yesterday. So um, as you can see, I've, I've created a directory. I've got the files. This is going to install workgroup edition. Uh, I ran uh, IDS install, and I'm telling it where to put the software. And I'm putting it in a directory called 1410DE uh, for developer edition. I'm telling it to, yes, create a server. I told it to create it for 1,000 users, even though development edition won't work with that. Press return, and away I go. And it's actually doing the install. And uh, after it's done with the install, it's going to create a default server. So now it's initializing the server. I'm getting a default server up there. This probably takes the longest part because uh, it's configuring the DB spaces, the CPUs, and the shared memory for that server. And then it's done. And uh, once it's done, I can come over here. And uh, if I type on stat dash, I can see I have a server. Now, I did this yesterday. So it's been up for about two days. It's up and running. And uh, if I do an onstat dash uh, g um, sch, here are all the onanets. It's running 10 onanets uh, from the default install. If I do an onstat minus g seg, I'll see the memory it's using. Uh, it's only using uh, 882 uh, megabytes. Uh, of memory. I can do an onstat dash D, and the default install creates all these DB spaces. Let me spread this out a little bit so you can see it better. Uh, next week, I will show you how to, to configure a very specific one for your requirements. This is just the default install and what it did, and uh, all these DB spaces. It created. Um, now, if I go into DB Access, and uh, I've got the system databases, I've got nothing else there. What I like to do, I'm going to uh, make a make a directory called Demo. CD to Demo, and I'm going to say DB Access Demo. And now it's going to create the stores demo database for me. And I'm going to say yes to copy all the SQL scripts. And so in about 10 minutes, I've got Informix installed. Uh, and, and I think this is great. You can get a little VM, uh, put Linux on it, download the developer edition, install it, and, and you have a a demo system here that you can play with. Uh, so now if I go back into DB Access, do query, I have the stores demo database there. 
and I can run uh, any one of these uh, scripts. Let's uh, just run a join script and I can see data uh, from my little demo server that I've got here. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the software directory structure. Uh, after you've installed Informix, this is what you get. And um, I'm going to CD to uh, opt. Uh, I've got all these different versions here. Let's uh, CD to dollar Informix dir, which is going to be the version I just installed. And here are the directories uh, that I have uh, installed here. The bin directory is the key directory that has uh, all the executables, and this has to be in your path. The demo directory has uh, demonstration files and source code. You want to copy it out of there. Don't mess with it in the demo directory, because if you change anything, that will affect everybody else down the road. Uh, I usually say copy it out of there or run like DB Access demo uh, to, to copy it out. The ETC directory will contain the configuration files. Uh, the include directory includes all your uh, software and uh, library files for compilers. Uh, message uh, is uh, the error message files. And release, this is a key one I want to uh, point out. The release directory uh, will have a directory for your language, and then it'll have a directory for the part number that you speak, um, and then it'll have a series of files that are unique uh, to your install. This is later than the manuals. The one you really want to look at is the one called IDS Machine Notes. This will have all the latest information on what your version was compiled on, what patches need to be applied, if any, um, what the libraries are, uh, what the kernel settings should be uh, for your server to run. And, and it's something, every time I do a upgrade, that's the first place I look to see is anything changed in this upgrade uh, on this machine that I need to do. Really important directory. Now, using Informix SQL. To connect to Informix, you have to have four environment variables set. One thing that's really nice about this demo uh, and having it uh, uh, do everything Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. When you do an install, Informix creates a couple of files here. Uh, this is if you do a default install and have it configure a server that has everything you need for the environment for your server. So this has my Informix server my Informix server, my onconfig, uh, my SQL host, and the path uh, set up. At the very minimum, you need Informix dir path, the Informix server, and then uh, the port, uh, I mean, the, sorry, the onconfig file uh, that you're going to use. And here's an example uh, environment file that you might set up in your dot profile with those variables set in it. Now, once you've got uh, it installed, you can use DB Access. It comes with the engine. It includes all the new features of the latest engine release. Uh, there is another product called Informix ISQL, which is a separate standalone product. Uh, it does not include all the latest features of the engine, uh, but it does include a ACE report writer and perform screens uh, if you want to set up uh, some character mode screens. DB Access, uh, when you fire it up, 
you'll get a menu like this for a query language. We'll take you right into query language, and uh, you can you can start typing SQL. Connect will allow you to connect to different servers. Uh, database will allow you to pick a database. Table will allow you to pick a table, and session will tell you about your session. That's there. If you go into SQL, you can create a new SQL. You can run. You can choose. Uh, what I did earlier. Let me go back here. I, I did DB access. I picked query language. I said, OK, let's do the stores demo. And then I did choose. And that allows me to pick SQL uh, statements that are there in my directory. Uh, new allows you to create SQL statements using the built-in Informix editor. It's very primitive. Uh, it's, it's almost um, painfully primitive. I, I typically uh, use user editor and uh, then use VI. So I'll come over here and say, instead of modify, which gives me the basic editor, there's not much you can do there. And there's no search and replace. I'll go here, user editor, say VI, and now I'm in VI and I can, I can edit things the way I want to. Uh, in the basic editor, uh, it only has five commands. Escape means you're done. Control A is insert or type over. Control R redraws the screen. Control X deletes the current character. And Control D deletes the rest of the line. Now, where DB Access is really helpful is uh, you can run DB Access in scripts and uh, from the command line. I've built whole systems uh, using DB Access in shell scripts. And uh, you, can, you can do uh, DB Access database name. Let me jump over here and script name and run a script. Or you can do DB Access. Uh, what I like is a minus E option, which will echo the SQL as you're running it. So if I come over here, and let's pick uh, DB Access minus E, uh, I'm going to say stores demo. And I'm going to say, uh, let's do this little script here. It gave me the SQL, and it showed me the results. Um, it's one, one thing that I, I like doing uh, quite a bit. You can also embed your SQL and pipe it uh, into it, uh, because you can write it. It's very easy to, to do pipes. Find error. This is your magic utility to find out what an error number means. When you get an error number like 327, you don't know what that means. And so if you type find ERR, spell find right, minus 327, boom. It gives you the error message and a brief description of what it means. Now, sometimes the description won't be very helpful, but it's at least a starting place uh, to get you looking at, at what's going on. The Informix command line utilities. I'm going to go through all of these later on. I showed you some on stat ones uh, today. We'll, we'll spend quite a bit on on stat later on in the set of tutorials. A couple of other ones I want to show you. DB schema uh, prints the schema of a database. So I can say DB schema minus D stores demo, pipe it through more, and I get the schema, including all the objects, all the stored procedures, all the cast uh, that are in that date demo database, a good way to find out uh, what's, what's there. DB export will export a database. Uh, there's also a DB load command to load data. Uh, DB import will import a database done from an export. Uh, and then there's also the high performance loader. 
Now, last thing, documentation. All the Informix documentation is available at this place. Let's bring it up. Now, the problem is IBM keeps moving their links around. So these links work today. I apologize if you're listening to this a year from now and they don't work. Uh, but this is where you can pick the specific version uh, of the product you want to look at. And if I pick 14, I'll get into the Informix 14 documentation set. And I can, uh, I can look at what's new. I can look at the administrative guide. Um, there are several PDFs I can download here. Uh, it's a good place to start. Something else I want to show you, uh, and this is true in 12 and earlier. Uh, you used to be able to download uh, the Informix doc set. And uh, I, I used to, it's not available for uh, 14. The last that was done was 1210XC8. Uh, uh, and this gives you all the documentation locally. Oftentimes I'm in a data center where I don't have internet access. And this is invaluable because now I have all the documentation on my PC. Um, I have the administrator's guide. Uh, which I use all the time. And uh, once you get to know uh, the documentation, you can come right in here, and there are the PDFs uh, for all the documentation. I really love that. I hope Informix uh, IBM comes out with that for uh, version uh, 14 sometime soon. Now, the key manuals. Uh, I think as a database administrator, you want the administrator's guide and then the administrator's reference. These are the two key ones for you as a database administrator. And every time I teach a class, after class, I tell folks, go download those two manuals. Um, for SQL developers, or really for any developer, this Informix Guide to SQL Syntax is really good. Uh, let me bring that up. I just want to show you that here, uh, SQL Syntax. And uh, what I like about it is I can say, show me the table of contents. Here is every SQL statement. Like I want to see the options for create database and boom. There are all the options for create database. Uh, there are examples there. Uh, this is available online too. So you can find the version 14 uh, online. But everything you need is right there uh, for your developers. Uh, there's also an SQL guide to tutorial for new users who are just learning SQL. Now, a couple of key resources on the web, and then I'll stop and take questions. I see there are a bunch in there I've, I've been missing. I apologize for that. Um, let me come, come to them in just a minute. The first thing is uh, the Informix documentation. The second thing is Carlton Doe has uh, two things I really like. One is the uh, Informix Editions, which uh, is on the IIUG website, I believe. Let's see where the link goes. And it compares what's in all the different editions. And he updates this very uh, frequently. Uh, he also just did a great new video on the IIUG website that talks about the version 14 installer, that if you're installing 14, you ought to go look at. If you're not a member, please go join the IIUG, the Informix International User Group. Uh, it's free. And uh, once you join, you'll get on their mailing list. Uh, once a month, you'll get a newsletter from them with the latest Informix news. That's well worth it. Uh, and a uh, really great, great group of folks 
and they do great conferences. Keep an eye out uh, for when the next conference is going to be. And then uh, on our website, uh, we have a whole tech info section, and we're working on this. Uh, Tom just added a couple of posts uh, that, that we're working on, uh, but you can see all our webcast replays here and uh, all our, uh, our, uh, our tech topics. Uh, Informix for be Beginners, uh, pretty soon uh, I'm going to have this whole series up there uh, so you can go look at them and, and see it there. But webcast replays uh, is a place to go look at all the past webcasts we've ever done. And we've done over 60 webcasts. Uh, everything from uh, update stats to using the SQL optimizer, indexes, migrations. Uh, one I'd really recommend if you're on any version before 14, go look at the webcast I did last April on upgrading to version 14 um, and, and see what's there. So let me take a look at questions. And I apologize that I've been ignoring the chat. Uh, let's see. Ernest, uh, good question. If you do the default install, the question is, did I have to pre-create my root DB space and all that? No. If you do the default install, where you say have the install configure a server, it allocates all that for you. Now, the disadvantage with that, and, the, and this is a key point, is it puts it all in the, uh, the same directory where the software is in a directory called storage. So if I cd to informix dir storage, that's where I put it all. Now I can move it out and create links now, but uh, it does that default. It also defaults to this one size. And I would really like to, uh, to see more options with uh, configuring size, but that's what you get. You do get up and running, and there's some really nice advantages to having that default install. Um, but it it creates space and it puts it in the same directory where you're installing the software. So if you don't have enough room in slash op, uh, it may fail uh, because you don't have enough room for where it goes. That's a really good question, Arnas. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got the chat window open, so I'll see it if you type something in the chat. Uh, uh, Jimmy has a very good uh, technical question. Uh, can can I t tell me if the Informix web blade works with Apache 2.4? And I'll be honest, I don't know. Um, I have not used it with 2.4. It's been a long time since I've used uh, the, the web blade. Uh, what I would suggest, one of the things I really like, if you join the IIUG, there is a email list that you can ask questions that go out to all the members uh, who have uh, uh, agreed to get emails. It's the old Informix list. And uh, that will, that's a good place to ask that and see who else is using that version. And I'll bet you'll find uh, folks that do it. Armin asks, what's the schedule of these webcasts? I'm coming to that in just a minute. In fact, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to drop to that. First thing, go to the IIUG website. If you're not a member, sign up. If you are a member, log in and go to, um, and make sure you join the uh, the mailing list uh, and the discussion groups because they're really, really helpful. Now, here's the schedule of what we're going to do. Uh, you, you can sign up for the next one. Uh, I'm probably going to put the next four up uh, on the website uh, so you can sign in uh, later next week. Um, but this is right now the plan for what we're going to do. Uh, 
The next one is going to be con configuring a new server from scratch. So instead of running the install, I'm going to show you how to allocate space uh, for chunks and how to allocate, change the on config file uh, for memory and CPU and all the key things you need to do to get a brand new server up and running. And I'm going to show you how to script it. Then in March, we'll talk about disk space. In April, we'll talk about managing Informix logs. How do you get uh, logs to automatically back up? A key thing. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, backup recovery and high availability in May. One of the things uh, it's very easy to do is to set up a high availability uh, data replication, and that is to have another server exactly like your server that gets all the information that's ready to take over in case your server fails. And uh, we'll talk about backup recovery and setting up high availability a data replication in May. In June, we'll talk about uh, how users can connect. And I'm going to talk about a couple of other tools that you can use, like a GUI uh, server studio. And, um, some of the other tools I use, the Rust interface, MongoDB, uh, uh, to connect to Informix. And then we'll talk about monitoring uh, tables and databases in July. And August, we'll end up with some basic performance tuning and monitoring tips. So that's our plan. This does not replace a training course, by the way. Um, Think of it as just a preview of what we have. If you can't wait, in May, we have uh, a full uh, Informix for Database Administrators class. Uh, we've already got people registering for that class, so that class is definitely on. Uh, we don't, if we get one person uh, signed up for a class, that class becomes a definite. And I will then change my schedule rather than change the class. Um, the other two classes don't have people registered yet, uh, so so they may change, uh, but they'll always be on our website uh, where where they are, when they are. I'm pretty sure they're not going to change though. If you want uh, private training, uh, we do that. In fact, if you have four people from a company, it's cheaper to have a private class. And last year, I taught more private classes than I did these, I call these public classes where anybody can sign up. They're a lot more fun too, because in a private class, I can look at your data and talk about your configuration and your server and your needs. And uh, so it's a lot more fun uh, that way. And uh, if you wanna come here, we have room in our training room for four students. Uh, we have eight servers, so our classes are limited to eight students. Uh, four here in our training server, we can take all eight online. Uh, and I've done some classes. I did one recently for a group in India. I did it on uh, Bombay time, I called it. So I started at nine o'clock the morning, uh, their time, which was in the evening, my time. I stayed up all night. A lot of fun doing that. Uh, but each student gets their own server, uh, which has 16 gigs of RAM. It's a fast uh, SSD drive. Really important for this benchmarking class, which oftentimes Art and I do together uh, if, if it works out that way. Um, also, please visit our new website. Uh, we just uh, did a refresh. It's up and running. Uh, I mentioned it in the last webcast I did. We had a number of you beta test it. I really appreciate your feedback. Uh, if you try and click on something that you think should be there that's not there because it got moved in the new website, please let us know. We're trying to fix their few broken links still. We're trying to fix them. And uh, the cool thing is uh, the website works on your iPhone or your Android phone. Uh, so you can go sign up for a, a a class on your phone or sign up for the next webcast on your phone. 
And with that, I think I'm out of time. I really appreciate uh, everybody coming to get today. And uh, just a reminder, um, if I go to the website, let's make sure it all works. And uh, the next webcast is February 27th. Uh, you do need to register for each webcast. The way uh, the Cisco WebEx system uh, works is you, you got to register for each one. So I look forward to seeing everybody then. Thank you, and have, have a good day. Bye now.